thank everybody for being here this morning. What I'd like to do today is start out a series that I'm calling Snapshots of Jesus. And, and my idea behind this series is what are some of the pictures that we see about Jesus as we look through especially the Gospels. So I thought I'd start out, you got to start somewhere, I thought I'd start out looking at the Gospel of Mark. And I have about three different snapshots to show you today. So the three snapshots we're going to look at, the first one is basically a picture of perspective. Whoops. The second one is a look at things from a Greco-Roman perspective. The Greek-Roman world puts an interesting slant on things. And then third but not least is from a biblical perspective. Now we have people of all ages in this class. We also have people with all sorts of biblical background. I've got some people. How many of you have been in church less than 10 years? Active in a church. A number of hands. How many of you have been active in a church more than 50 years, raise your hand. A bunch of hands go up. How many of you have a PhD in religious studies? Raise your hand. A hand goes up. Keep your hand up. How many of you have taught New Testament Greek for over 20 years? A hand goes up. Glad to have you here, Dr. Capes. I get the joy of teaching not only y'all, but via the internet, I get the joy of speaking to people all over the world. We get emails. I got emails over the holidays. Uh, uh, people missing the class. People wishing it was going on from the Philippines, from Germany, from England, from Africa, from a number of different places. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Because one of the joys I get is trying to sculpt a lesson that will appeal to all ages, all educations, all backgrounds of theology in all languages and all cultures. And you say, well, that's a tough chore. And I say, not really. Because if I can stay true to the biblical text, the biblical text does speak to people of all ages, all educations, all exposure levels. It's the biblical text is simple enough to where you can wade in it as a wading pool, but it's deep enough to where you could swim in it like a whale. And so you've got some wonderful chances to do it, and that's what I want to do with you today is start some of these snapshots. And some of what I say, you'll be saying, man, that's just out there. I don't, I'm not getting it. Don't worry about that. I have to talk to Capes too. He hauled all the way down here for class. So I've thrown in a couple of nuggets for him. All right, let's go. Let's start with that first snapshot of perspective. We're looking for the next couple of weeks at least, maybe the next month or two, at the Gospel of Mark and teachings of Jesus and teachings about Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. Now Mark is one of three Gospels that tend to see things in the same way. Or in Greek, they are soon optical. They are synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell many of the same stories in many of the same ways, John tells it from a very different perspective. But even if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see differences in some of the language, in some of the emphasis, and in some of the order in which the stories are told. Now that bothers some people who are new to the Bible. Because they say, well, if they're in a different order, then someone got it right and someone got it wrong, and now there's an error in the Bible. Not at all. What we need to understand is we've got to learn to read the Bible within the context historically where it was written. And there's not one 
writer in the Bible. Now, God wrote the Bible. I, I believe that it's inspired by God fully, but he used people to do it. So you see in Scripture not only a reflection of the hand of God and the guiding hand of God, but you see the voice and the pen and the language of the people that God's inspiring to write. And so when you look at the Bible, you can see things, and I promise you not one of those biblical writers had Miss Kingston for 11th grade English in Lubbock, Texas at Coronado High School. They just didn't. They did not have to write a theme paper where you had to turn it in with your thesis sentence and your outline first and make sure that it's all written together. In order. We are trained in our day to think of things chronologically. That's not always historically the way things were written or why they were written. And so when we look at the Gospel of Mark, instead of relating it as something that's outlined in a very clear fashion, like a theme paper might be for us today, I urge you to look at it like a bouquet of flowers. Mark's not putting these things in a chronological order. He's putting them in a snapshot order like a, a, a bouquet of flowers so that the effect is the whole not just the individual. Now my mom's got a cutting garden and she's got loads of flowers that she's picked to go in the cutting garden. And you can go and you can look at the birds of paradise and say, ah, here's all of her birds of paradise and they're, they're beautiful. But what really makes the garden sing is when she'll take the birds of paradise and she'll take some of the other flowers and Carol Wilson's frequently helping her and they're out there together putting together these flower arrangements. And then my sister Catherine comes and fixes it and makes it really look good. And that's the way it works. And you see that arrangement and it's brilliant. And that's the way Mark arranges his gospel. So he'll put two stories next to each other, not because they happened one after the other, but because he wants you to contrast the two. Or he wants you to compare the two. And so this is part of our journey as we look through this. We're going to be looking at it. So there are certain themes that are repeated, like a wilderness theme. Jesus will go out in the wilderness. Uh, the same Greek word for wilderness is used and translated desolate place. And we'll see things happening over and over. And that theme is there for us, like a, a flower that's repeated in the arrangement. It's not just the wilderness theme. You've got a, a sea theme. And, and there are a number of really important things that Jesus teaches and says by the sea. There are actually three very important G things Jesus teaches on the sea. And so you've got this repeated theme that's just kind of going through there of the sea. These aren't the only themes. You've got a lot of stuff that happens in a house. And Mark sets these things up with these key words like this because he wants these stories to knit together in a theme. So as we're looking at snapshots and pictures, we're looking at things that will in sometimes bounce us around a little bit in the Gospel of Mark because we'll want to examine the flower for each. Now, Mark is a floral arrangement of stories to be heard in the Greek. The Greek was written more so than for someone to just sit and read it and study it. It was written for people to hear it. There are a lot of, of listening clues, clues that plug you in. The themes are one of them because those themes will reverberate. You'll be saying, oh yeah, he's already said something about that place. Already said something about that place. Already said something about that place. And so those tie it together. But he's got certain other vocabulary words that he uses dozens and dozens of times. You know, again in the Greek, palin. He'll, he'll use these words over and over and over because it's something that you were originally intended to hear. We've got an ability to put it down here. We've got a Bible that people can have. You can have one electronically on your phone. We can read it and study it very carefully. But the original was written with the idea that someone would read it really in probably one session 
Though there are some places where it looks like if you were going to break it apart, you could. We don't have the benefit in here of me being able to just read you the Greek. Well, actually, I could, but you would leave. Um, except for David, and he would correct my pronunciation. So either way, it's lose, lose, lose. All right? But if I could read it to you in the Greek, that's one thing. But instead, we've got the English. But that's okay. Because the English works in marvelous ways and God wrote something that just as it appeals to people of all ages and cultures and educational levels, it also appeals and spans the ages. So we can get more into it by looking at it in Greek and looking at it historically, but it is nonetheless fully informative of incredible life-changing eternity changing good news just reading it in English and so we'll look at it and what we're going to do as snapshots is look to some degree at the entire floral arrangement but we're going to single out certain flowers for a picture and try to follow through those flowers as we go through it so with that as some measure of background let me tell you a little bit of a snapshot just from the structure of Mark. Now, the whole book is only 16 chapters. It's the shortest gospel. It's very easy to read it out loud one time. I'm not saying it happens in five minutes. I'm not saying in our culture and day and age that it, it's easy for us to follow. By the way, side note here, throw these in occasionally. Did you know that the chemical connections in your brain, the neural synapses, they establish these pathways of thinking where you just think certain ways, okay? And it happens because you're trained to think certain ways. It's why word association is a useful testing tool. I say up, you say down. If you are thinking in opposites, I say you know, whatever, whatever. Word association allows brain students and teach people, gurus, to know how your synapses align. Well, one of the ways that you don't realize you have been trained in your brain is from media where every show, basically, you've ever watched of any value at all, entertainment value, changes the camera angle within every seven seconds. You don't have just one camera angle on for longer than seven seconds. They'll switch between one speaker or another, one speaker or another, one angle or another, because they want to keep you interested. And so you can, sometimes just for grins, I'll watch a TV show that's a good TV show or a good movie, and I'll spend the time counting seconds on the camera angle. One, two, three, shift. One, two, three, four, shift. One, two. I'm really fun to binge watch with. <laughs> so our brains are trained that way. It makes it a little harder for us to understand that somebody would sit and just read 16 chapters out loud to everybody and people would grasp what was being said. But they didn't watch a lot of TV back in the time of Christ and the early church, and so their brains weren't trained the way ours were, and they were better able to listen. You can go back to the pre-TV generation, and they were better able to listen. They could listen to the radio, they could listen to a speaker, and we're not that good at that anymore. It's hard for us. One reason I use pictures is to try to keep your attention because it's at least something changing behind me. So you've got 16 chapters. They're meant to be read uh, uh, all together in some ways. And the whole book culminates. I mean, the, the, the whole book drives toward and ends with the cross and resurrection of Christ. That's, that's the book. But... In the process of getting there, there are some interesting things along the way. And one of the things that I want to talk to you about from perspective is the opening section. 
And it's kind of a reader's guide or a listener's guide. The first 13 verses is spoiler alert. It's setting things up for you so that you've got a better understanding of what it is you're going to be listening to. The, the, the first 13 verses tell, uh, explain the gospel, set the gospel up from a different perspective than the rest of the gospel. So this perspective is one that gives heaven's view of what's going on. You get God's view. You get to step out of the earth, step out of the present, and get to see the eternal message behind this book. And then you get into the book itself, and you get to be amongst the rest of us while the story unfolds. So if we break this apart and we understand that the reader's guide section, this opening section, is one that's offering heaven's view, then we'll understand the rest of it is a bunch of bewildered people. So this first part tells us how things really are. They're what God has to say about it. The other parts are us just in a world of bewilderment. So you've got passages like Mark 4.13. In Mark 4.13, you've got uh, people not understanding the teachings of Jesus. Let's get some text up here. Jesus is telling, speaking in parables. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve ask him about the parables. And he says... To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything's in parables so that they see, but they don't understand. They don't perceive. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. Does that sound like Jesus? Well, this is stuff I want us to look at. These are snapshots I want us to see. Because he says to them, you don't understand this parable? How are you going to understand all the parables? And he starts explaining them. His disciples are bewildered by his teaching. They don't get it. His disciples don't understand his authority. They're, in Mark 4, 41, they're out on the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm. They have to wake him up. He calms the storm and they're stunned. They said, what is going on? Even the wind and the, the seas obey him? They're bewildered. There's no bewilderment from God. God's very clear. God sees things as they are. God, God, we get that in the reader's guide. But in the rest of the book, we're just among the masses of people who are sitting there. They don't understand his death. Jesus says, I'm going to go, I'm going to die. And the reaction is one of, uh, no, that's not going to happen. Look at this. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. I mean, think about the picture of this, what's going on. It's, it's not just, oh, Jesus, I hate it, has to be this way. It's... <clears throat> Come here. Let's get away from everybody else. We need, I got to tell you something privately, okay? Uh, don't say things like this, okay? This is not, this is not appropriate. This isn't good. Uh, it's de demoralizing. It's dispiriting. And, you know, we're following you with the plan of victory. And I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm in with the troops. And this is not the way to lead the troops, and Jesus <laughs> says, turns and sees his disciples, which means, you know, Peter's over here. Here it is. Peter's like, hey, I want to tell you something. The guys over there, this is not what they need to be hearing, all the rest. And Jesus is kind of like, 
listen, Peter, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> and rebukes him in front of everybody. It is, reminds me of the time when Becky and I had first been married and I, we were at a dinner or something and I don't remember what was going on, but she, uh, I was obviously saying something inappropriate or wrong and because she starts kicking me under the table. And I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Doesn't even occur to me. I'm bewildered. And I, so I just looked at her and said, why are you kicking me under the table in front of everybody? And she's like, because I didn't want everybody to know that I was telling you, da 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 you know, we had this dialogue um, in front of everybody. That's what goes on here. And it's a fascinating account. But Mark is showing that we don't always get it even though God does, and we get in the beginning this things as they really are. So with that in mind, let's look at the first 13 verses and, and get a, a feel for them. Mark 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it's written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then John appears. He's baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now if you remember your other biblical stories... In your other biblical stories, Jesus will go to John to be baptized and John will say, I should not be baptizing you. You know, you, you, you're the son of God. I need to be baptized by you. I don't need you to be here and all the rest of this stuff. Because he doesn't, Mark doesn't give that. Because this is not the bewildered people part of the book. This is the divine heavenly view of the book. And God's laying it out there. Just the facts here. I've baptized with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by, Jordan, John, uh, by John in the Jordan. See, leaves out that other part. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you're my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. And after that, we've got Jesus beginning his ministry in Galilee. And that's it. So Mark is not filling in the stories of the temptations of Jesus. Mark is not filling in the questioning of John the Baptist. He's just giving the bird's eye view, the view from the heavens. This is the way things are. And the way things are is very clear. This is the gospel that was proclaimed in Isaiah and other parts of the Old Testament. He actually is quoting several other passages and combining them there. But this is the Jesus that God has put forward. This is God's work. And John the Baptist came and did what he was supposed to do. And Jesus is baptized and God proclaims, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm pleased. And he goes out in the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan, but he comes, he's ministered to by angels. And this is the story. And this is your reader's guide. You've got Jesus, the Son of God. You've got divine planning. Let me, let's do it this way. You've got 
God initiating this story. The story doesn't start out. There were a bunch of lost people who were crying out for GPS directions back to the heart of God. And so God heard their cry and said, I will come and I will give you GPS directions. No, this is all started by God hundreds of years before Christ. It's prophesied and the plans are laid out. And John the Baptist is foretold in Isaiah 40. And John the Baptist comes out. This is all God's initiating because it's God's plan. Don't ever think you walk with God because you planned it. Don't ever think you walk with God because you initiated a relationship with Him. Don't ever think you walk with God because it's your right to something you earned. God has initiated a way to restore fellowship between sinful people and Him. God has put a plan in place. It's been in place for long before the incarnation of Jesus, Paul will say to the Ephesians that God planned it before the foundation of the earth. And so God initiated it, God plans it, and God does the work. This is my beloved son. This is Jesus Christ, the son of God. This is God's work. The gospel is the work of God. Not the work of you, me, or anyone else. So God initiates it, God plans it, God works it, and Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the one who is, is, is worthy to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who is Son and Savior and Conqueror. He will conquer just as he conquered Satan in the wilderness. He conquers death. This is the good news. So I hope we see in this first snapshot a perspective. Because as we look at different photos of Jesus through the gospel, we're going to see a lot of bewildered people. But we need to not just see bewildered people. We need to see the divine perspective as well. Now, let's talk Greco-Roman stuff for a moment. This is uh, uh, not just for Larry Burgess, but this is the kind of stuff Larry Burgess is going to email me about if I don't do it first. Because Larry Burgess reads everything Tom Wright ever wrote. And Tom Wright is really big on this. In fact, I think when I interviewed Tom once in this class, he made a reference to it. I may be wrong. I may be thinking of another conversation with him. But Tom is a, a dear friend, a wonderful biblical scholar, a preeminent biblical scholar in our age. And he would want me to make this point, so we're going to make it for Tom and for Larry. Here it is. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Greek, arche is uh, beginning. That's uh, one of the meanings of the word. It's not the only, but, but beginning of the euangelio of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, that may sound like to us in English something that says, oh, well, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I've learned that much, and this must be the start of one of them. Makes sense. But in the Greco-Roman world, there's a really good chance that this had a lot more meaning than that. If we go to the Greek, now this is the Greek from Codex Alexandrinus. Codex Alexandrinus, around 400, maybe a little bit later, A.D., is one of the best manuscript copies we have of the Greek Bible. And so you can see here the R.K., uh, to uh, euangelio, you can see it there on Codex Alexandrinus because those are the two Greek words beginning, in beginning, sort of, um, of the gospel. The beginning, not in, the beginning of the gospel. Okay? Beginning of the gospel. R.K. 
euangelium. And by the way, you may be wondering, euangelium, I've learned enough Greek to know that that's a G-G. That'd be you agelio. Well, the G-G is an N-G in effect. And earlier in Greek, it was often written as an N-G. Okay, so just, that's a freebie. Let's go to Turkey. Let's go down here about 10 miles inland on the Meander River to a town called Priene, or Priene, as they would have called it back then. 9 B.C., the city fathers decided to do something really significant. The ruler of the Roman Empire at the time is Caesar Augustus. And they decided in 9 BC, the rulers of this Priene city, decided that they would redo their whole calendar where the year would be targeted to the birth of Caesar, Augustus, so they could curry favor with him. Um, someone sent me an email uh, uh, here in class asking me what I thought about an article that was talking about 2022 and talking about all of the Hebrew implications, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Here are the significant points of 22. And, and, and so this stuff, this is what we need to look forward to happening in 2022 because of all of these things. And, and my immediate reaction was, I wonder if the author took into account the fact that this is 2022 by our Western calendar that was put into place in the 600 AD era and it's not 2022 by the Hebrew calendar that was in place at the time the Hebrews were writing. We, calendars are weird things, and we just automatically assume stuff from our perspective. But back then, they could change the calendar any way they wanted to. Uh, most calendars that in the Roman Empire uh, that were from Rome were, were dated from the inception of this founding of the city of Rome. AUC. But... Priene decides in 9 BC they're going to start their calendar all over again. And so there's these two big rocks that you can find in the Berlin Museum that have engraved in them some Hebrew. And if I blow that rock up a little bit, this section right here is rather informative. Here it is with a couple of words highlighted. This word looks like something very, they wrote in capitals. These are all capitals. This word may look foreign to you. And this word may not, you may not recognize it so readily. But what you've got here, if we put it into English, is the Erickson de Toy. Isn't that interesting, David? They had the iota at the end of the, uh, same here with Cosmoi. Tone di autone. Euangelion is what it would have said if they had uh, uh, not broken off the end of it. And then the next line says, to Theu, to Theu, of God. Here's what they did. I'm going to give you the whole thing, but I'll pull out what it is. The whole thing if we read it. Decree of the Greek assembly in the province of Asia on motion of the high priest Apollonios, son of Menophilos of Isianoi, whereas providence that orders all our lives has in her display of concern and generosity in our behalf adorned our lives with the highest good. What's the highest good? Caesar Augustus, whom she's filled with virtue. For the benefit of humanity. And this is just a big suck up to the Caesar. Caesar Augustus, filled with virtue for the benefit of humanity, and has in her beneficence granted us and those who will come after us a Savior who has made war to cease, and who shall put everything in peaceful order. And whereas Caesar, when he was manifest, transcended the expectations of all who had anticipated the good news, not only by his surpassing the benefits conferred by his predecessors, but by leaving no expectations surpassing him to those who would come after him, keep going, with the result that the birthday of our God to Theu, 
our God meaning Caesar Augustus. The birthday of Caesar Augustus, our God, signaled the beginning of good news for the world because of him. And that's the section, the Exende Toi, uh, Cosmoi Toi, Dia Auton, Euangelion. That's it, the beginning of good news for the world because of him. Uh, so we've discovered a way to honor Augustus, hitherto unknown among the Greeks. We're the first to do this, namely to reckon time from the date of his birth. Therefore, with the blessings of good fortune and for their own welfare, the Greeks in Asia decreed the new year begin for all the cities on September 23rd, which is the birthday of Augustus, to ensure that the dates coincide in every city, all documents are to carry both the Roman and the Greek date. And the first month shall, in accordance with the decree, be observed as a month of Caesar, beginning with September 23, the birthday of Caesar. I and mean, it's just a big suck up. But what it tells you is the use of the language, the beginning of the gospel or the beginning of good news that specific language that Mark is using for Jesus the Son of God is language that was familiar throughout Asia at least Turkey familiar and probably in the Roman world as well because I mean something like this starts it's a big deal so it's familiar language to mark some massive event. So this beginning of the gospel, other than the fact that RK is put into a, an aorist form, and it's a bit of an irregular verb, and so you've got a different form structure there, but it's get ready for the huge and historic true marking of divine time and history. That's the idea behind this Greek phrase that Mark's using. It's one that to the Greek world would have been hugely significant. Not some fake wannabe Caesar Augustus, but the true divine son of God. By the way, if you wonder why subsequent Caesars persecuted Christians as some of this stuff became known, maybe they weren't reading the Gospel of Mark, but at least this whole idea was Jesus' kingdom is the true mark of God's work on earth. So we've got that. This is the beginning of the gospel, but it's not of Augustus. It's of Jesus Christ. And Christ, Jesus as Messiah, is something that Mark's going to come back to a couple of times. We've got it here, but we've got it three for emphasis. Mark 8, 29. Mark 14, 61. Look at 8, 29. Get a feel for this. On the way to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus goes with his disciples. On the way, he said, who do people say I am? Oh, you're Johnny the Baptist, you're um, Eliyah, you're the, one of the prophets. He says, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You get it again in Mark 14, 61. As we get... Uh, to the... Jesus in front of the high priest. The high priest says, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of the blessed? Jesus says, I am. And, you, and, and have, are you ever going to see something surprising? <laughs> You're going to see me come seated at the right hand of power with the clouds of heaven. That's, that's, that's Jesus. You want to get ready for the huge historic true marking of divine time and history you need look no further than God's initiated divinely inspired plans that he has had from before the beginning of time found in Jesus Christ and his gospel that's a pretty pretty big start you can go further and see he's the son of God 
And this is something repeated throughout the gospel. You've got it not only here, you've got it in Mark 9, 7. You've got it in Mark 12, 1 through 11. That's where Jesus is telling the parable about the son who goes to the vineyard. You've got it at the end, even the Roman soldier recognizes with the death of Christ. Indeed, this was the son of God. This is the true, huge and historic marking of divine time in history. And I think Tom Wright and, and uh, uh, his students do a good job of making that point. But there's something far beyond that point in this word that I want us to look at. And that's our third and final snapshot in the last eight minutes of class. And that's the biblical concept of gospel. And I want to look at it in a couple of different ways. So if we put the gospel back up here, this passage... I don't want to too nerd out on you for a moment. But there's a difference between a noun and a verb. Right? Nouns are person, place, and thing. Verbs are action words. Okay? Paul uniquely uses a gender-specific noun for gospel that you don't find anywhere else in antiquity and Paul imbues that word with very special meaning after Paul you find it but not before Paul one possible exception being that one inscription of Caesar Augustus but in the form in which Paul uses it in the gender in which Paul uses it in the singular manner in which Paul uses it no nobody else So we'll talk about Paul in a moment. But gospel is also in a verb form of delivering good news. The word gospel literally is a composite of two words. You is good and angelos is news or message. You can combine them and it's in a verb form bringing good news or proclaiming good news. And you'll find that verb form used over and over in Isaiah including Isaiah 40, a little bit later that Mark quotes from, Isaiah 52, 7, 66, 61, 1. Whoops. Let's take just a moment and give you a flavor for those because these are powerful when you see that Isaiah is using the verb form of this word. Isaiah 40, verse 9. Go up on a high mountain, herald of good news... Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. That's the good news that's being preached. Behold your God. And if we read over this gospel and only go to Asia Minor... To understand the meaning of that word, we're missing something very important. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Again, the verb form, but look at it. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Who publishes salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. That's the good news. That's the news of salvation. God reigns. You're not under the domination of sin. You're not under the domination of the evil one. Even as bad things happen, they don't control you. They don't dictate your life. You live in the kingdom of forgiveness under the God who brings good news brings salvation because he reigns over everything that's happened in your life and mine God reigns look at Isaiah 60 verse 6 more good news of the gospel Isaiah 60 verse 6 a multitude of camels will cover you the camels of Midian and Ephah all those from Sheba shall come they'll bring gold frankincense And good news, the praises of the Lord. 
We're not so far from Christmas that the gold and frankincense add myrrh to it, and, and you're, you're there. Look at Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. All of these are that word gospel in a verb form. Jesus will quote this later in Mark. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pertain proclaim liberty to the captives opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to comfort those who mourn to the oil of gladness instead of mourning a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit that's the the gospel in its Old Testament form now you're reading the gospel of Matt, Mark And this might strike you as a bit odd. Because in the Gospel of Mark, this is the Gospel. This is the reader's view. From God's perspective, this is good news. But look at it from the perspective of everybody else. This good news is going to be like tearing up garments. This good news is going to be like bursting wineskins. Think fizzy coke. This good news is going to involve destroying the temple. This good news is going to involve destroying nations. This is good news that's going to call you to abandon everything that you hold dear. This is good news that's going to end with the gruesome death of the hero. And you may be thinking, how is this good news? From heaven's perspective it is. And if you find that bewildering, you're joining a good club. But this is where Paul's point really comes in. Because Paul uses that word euangelion in a way that nobody else did before his time. He seizes it in a form and he says, here's what I mean. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was resurrected on the third day. And those are the terms in which I preach to you this word, euangelion. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And Paul writes this before Mark's gospel. And Paul writes this to churches all over the the Mediterranean world. And Paul has formed many of those churches preaching this very message. That Christ died, that's the good news. And Mark gives that in his gospel. You look at it and say, well, why did Jesus die in the gospel of Mark? You can say he died because it was the will of God. Because that's what Jesus said in Mark 8. He says, this is what God's will is. Get behind me, Satan, if you don't agree with it. Jesus died because of obedience. He was obedient unto death. You can look at it and say, well, Jesus died because of the treachery of Judas and others. This is a death that came about because of bad people doing bad things. Or you can look at it and you can say, but he also died for many people. You can say he also died as a ransom for many people. You can say he died to establish a new covenant, the Athike. You can say he died to establish a new covenant. You can say he died for a new kingdom. You can look at passages like Mark 10, 45 and 14, 24 through 25, not 9. Take that 9 out, that's a typo. 14, 24 and 25. And Jesus says, he came to seek, and, uh, 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 the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. This is who he is. So the key to the death of Christ in the Gospel of Mark is the resurrection Those two are inextricably linked. Paul infuses a word with that meaning, gospel. But we're missing it if we only say this is an epoch event. This is an epoch-defining event. This is a a moment of history that, that, that explodes onto the scene that changes everything. Yes, but the reason it is is because Christ came and he died for you and me. Because it's a plan of salvation, not condemnation. Because it's a kingdom of heaven, not of this earth. And Jesus brings that kingdom to this earth and we begin to glimpse it and understand it and partake in it in this earth. 
And that is radical snapshot. So if we're looking at this from the perspective of God, and that's the lens, then I want us, these are our points for home. God seeks you out. You don't hear this by happenstance. You're not here by happenstance. God is seeking you out. He has been seeking you out long before the foundations of the earth. And not only is he seeking you out, but it's the biggest news you could ever have in your life. That he has brought the gospel to you to embrace. So as we start this new year, and we start this new series, I hope you'll come with me. I hope you'll follow these snapshots of Jesus as we look at them in all of these different perspectives because that's the way it is. Let me bless you, and we go to church. Father, in the name of Jesus, I do ask your blessings on all who might hear this message that your good news would resonate in their hearts, would fit like a piece of a puzzle to give them the encouragement they need, to give them the direction they need, to give them the purpose they need so that we can set ourselves aside and all of our rights and all that we want and embrace your gospel and find ways to make it known to the world. Your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray these things through Jesus. Amen. See you guys next Sunday, if not before.